singularity. Good morning from sunny Madrid. Right after the end of the most amazing uh, conference that I have attended at least in the last couple of years, the longevity and the first longevity and cryopreservation summit in the world, uh, which was also the warmest uh, cryo summit because it was in warm and sunny Spain, Madrid, Spain, to be honest. And today I have the man behind the puppeteer who makes everything happen uh, for that conference. And he is one of the most impressive people that I have ever met in my life because he's the single individual that I met so far who has his hands uh, involved in all kinds of cutting edge activities such as longevity, cryopreservation, education, and so on from Korea and Japan through all over Europe and finally, all the way into Silicon Valley as a founding faculty member of Singularity University. So, without further ado, let me introduce to you my friend, Jose Luis Cordero. Jose, thank you very much for being with us today. Well, Nicola, it is a pleasure for me to have you in Madrid, which is the city where my father was born, and that is why we decided to do this activity in Madrid, Spain. This is, this is so phenomenal because I did a very uh, interesting interview with Jose three or four years ago, uh, which he called the inergularity is near. And we'll talk about that in a second. So I recommend everyone go and check that phenomenal interview uh, if they want to have some more fun after they watch this one. However, at that time, I promised Jose the next interview will be in person. And I never even suspected that I will have the pleasure to do that in his father's hometown and in person like we are doing here today. So anyway, Let's jump into the meat of the matter here, and uh, let's do that this way. Jose, if I'm to ask you to introduce yourself in a couple of words, what's the best way to do that? Who is Jose Luis Cordero? You have so many activities, you wear so many hats, you're involved in so many things. So who is Jose? I am a futurist. I like to talk about the future. So that's the single word that describes me, a futurist. And maybe we could add transhumanist, singularitarian, Energularitarian. <laughs> and, and what's your motivation? You are one of the people who sleeps the least that I have met in my life. It seems like you almost never sleep. You jump from one plane to another plane. The other day you were in Korea. Today you're here. I have no idea even where you're going tomorrow. But what is Barcelona, the... Barcelona, Spain. OK. All right. Phenomenal. But what is the motivation for you to work so hard with such never ending energy? Like, how do you find the energy and what? Because it's got to be the motivation. Where is it coming from? What are you trying to do? Well, I want to change the world. I think we live in an incredible time, the very best time in history, and we have the ability to change the world for the better. And I try to inspire other people to do the same. So that is why I am always traveling, always. And uh, in fact, it's very complicated, as you might imagine, because I have homes in three countries. But anyway, um, I, I want to change the world. I want to live to see the future, I think it's going to get only better and better. Like we live today in the best possible time. I mean, it, it could be much better and it will be much better, but living today is better than living in the year 1900 or in the year 1800. We have seen incredible changes in the last few centuries, few millennia, but we are going to see even more. I like to say that in the next two decades, we are going to see more changes than in the last two millennia. In 20 years in the future, there will be more changes than in 2,000 years in the past. So this is incredible. This is to be excited. This is to be, you know, full of energy. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, where are your three homes? Which countries are they in? Oh, yeah. One is here in Madrid. Another one is in Venezuela, which is the country where I was born. And another one is in the USA. Uh, actually, um, it is kind of interesting because uh, my family left to Spain during the Fr French Francisco Franco dictatorship. And then I, I was born and I grew up in Venezuela, but because of the Hugo Chavez dictatorship, I left and I did many things in the USA. And I hope I don't have to emigrate also because of the Trump dictatorship. <laughs> but, but, but in any event, uh, I consider myself a citizen of the world. I don't believe in frontiers. I don't believe in borders. In fact, we are all Africans humans evolved in Africa. So we are actually all mutants. 
that uh, our first ancestors come all the way from Africa. So where, I, where am I from? I am from Africa. That is where I am from. <laughs> and from a little planet called planet Earth. And I plan to go beyond this little planet and see the space also in the next few decades. That sounds phenomenal. And of course, I agree with you because, as you know, my hero in the world, Socrates, he said I was born Athenian, but I'm a citizen of the world. And this is exactly how I feel uh, myself. I was born Bulgaria, Bulgarian. I am Canadian by choice, but I feel like I am a citizen of the world. Uh, and let me uh, uh, let me let me um, ask you this, though. What is the biggest issue of our time? Because we are facing a diversity of crisis and diversity of opportunities. What is the biggest issues that you think humanity should focus on addressing right now? Well, I am a very singularitarian in my thinking. And I do think, do believe that between 2029, when we are supposed to pass the Alan Turing to 2045, when we will reach the technological singularity, humanity will be transformed and we will evolve from this human world into a post-human world and we are not ready for that humanity is not prepared for that we are not prepared to transcend our own limitations to become better just like we evolved from some type of monkeys millions of years ago we are going to evolve into something different and i think much better uh, much uh, friendlier also much more intelligent and humanity is not ready for that because we are afraid of change uh, especially when we get older we don't want change we prefer the old bad things than the new good things so if you were so in that case uh, to answer my question is the singularity the most important issue of our time then in your view yes i think so and many things are related to the singularity one obviously is the increase of technology in all areas including energy which is one of my favorite fields but also longevity we will be able to live indefinitely we will probably see what i call the death of death mm -hmm. in fact that is my my next book the death of death and how we will transcend aging and we will cure aging we will rejuvenate people I like to say that in 30 years, when we do another interview, not the next one, we might have another one in between, okay. but in 30 years, I will be younger than today. Not older, younger than today. Why? Because we will have rejuvenation technologies. I hope it's true for both of us and, by the way, the rest of humanity, to anyone who wants to have that, because, of course, we know some people will choose not to do so, which is okay, but I hope this is available to anyone who w wishes to have it. But, uh, you know, let me share with our audience here today that the first time I saw you speak, uh, w which, by the way, uh, Jose is a phenomenal speaker, very engaging and very memorable because he, I have him etched into my mind that we are cacas. So I want Jose to tell us the story of, and I don't even speak Spanish, but I have remembered him to say we are cacas. So what does that mean that we are cacas, Jose? And can you tell us, please? Yeah, well, I like to track the exponential changes in technology. And in, in the case of computers, we have had incredible changes in the last uh, 30 years. And I show it with uh, how memory, computer memory and compu computer programming was done 30 years ago. And this is the first K. This is one K of memory. It was 10 by 100. Well, there were different sizes, but 10 by 100 is 1000. So this, this is one K, or as we say in Spanish, one K. But these mechanical memories, you could not change because you had to make, make little holes and then you could not take the holes out. So the electromechanical memories were invented. And you have a first uh, edition of those. This is eight inches big. And the first edition was also 1K. But this 1K was better because you could erase. So mechanical 1K, electromagnetic 1K. So 1K plus 1K makes 1K. <laughs> so we moved from caca 30 years ago to more advanced devices like this floppy disk of five inches and a quarter. This was 512 cacas. And then we moved to this floppy disk of um, 
a, a three and, and a half inches, and this has 1.4 mega, 1.4 mega. But now, here I have uh, a pen drive from the World Economic Forum, uh, which is 128 gigas. So look what has happened in 30 years, from one caca to 128 gigas. So what is going to happen in the future? I'm totally convinced that in 30 years, um, we are going to have this and more. So you will remember me, like you remember me now, and you will remember caca. But this will not be the caca of the future. This will be the caca of the future, because we will have devices smaller than these and with more power than our brain. In any event, we will connect our brain to the cloud by that time. But um, the exponential changes are, are radical, and people don't see them. But not only with computers, in infotechnology, also in nanotechnology, in biotechnology. And that is why most people don't, don't see the disruption in the medical sector and in biotechnology that will let us live indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So, and we are actually going to be the cacas at that time. Well, yes and no. We will be if we will if we don't upgrade ourselves, but I think we will. Most people will decide to enhance themselves, upgrade themselves, augment themselves, like I do with my glasses. I, I wear these glasses to enhance myself. Yeah. I use my mobile phone to enhance myself. I use computers to enhance myself. I travel uh, by airplane to enhance myself because I still don't have wings. I might have wings in the future, or I might communicate telepathically, because mm -hmm. this is another possibility. In the future, we will communicate telepathically. Neuralink. Yes, Neuralink. And this conversation will take one second, because all, all the information I want to tell you, it's in my head, yeah. but I cannot transfer it now. Why? We have a bo bottleneck of bandwidth between yes. people and, Absolutely. and technology. Yeah, our communication uh, technique now, which is uh, talking, it's also a caca technology. Talking is a caca technology. It's a primitive communication technology. In the future, uh, through broadband, telepathic communication very fast, we will communicate immediately. So imagine how much more we will communicate, we will learn, we will uh, uh, share with other people. This is incredible, incredible. We can do this with many people. We will uh, understand each other better. We will have more friends. So let's talk a little bit now about the longevity and cryonic summit. So first of all, can you tell us perhaps what was the sort of desire uh, or the impetus, the motivation behind setting the Congress to begin with and why you choose Madrid, Spain? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, I have been going to international meetings and conferences all over the world. And uh, last year, there were two interesting ones. One in, in Basel, Switzerland, about uh, cryonics, cryopreservation, which was excellent. In the tech park, technological park of uh, Basel. Basel is a very important pharmaceutical city in Switzerland. Novartis and many other huge companies are based in Basel. So that was a fantastic meeting, but only in cryonics. Also, in uh, a few months earlier, in August 2016, there was the first RAD Fest. RAD is R-A-A-D, Revolution Against Aging and Death. RAD, Revolution Against Aging and Death, which was basically about longevity, extension, even the possibility of physical immortality. And so I decided to combine them both, to have the longevity part as plan A. I call that immortality is plan A. But in case you die, we have plan B. And plan B is cryopreservation. So we are trying to combine plan A and plan B in the same event. And why in Madrid? Because um, my father, who was born here, he died uh, relatively recently. And this is obviously a shock to any person. When someone you, you love, that you admire, dies, and, and so I decided to do it here in Madrid. Um, there is also something very special about Spain. Uh, and the motto of Spain is plus ultra. It, it is very interesting historically because um, a few centuries ago, actually, it was non plus ultra because Spain represented the end of the known world of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. There were two columns the columns of Hercules. One was in Spain, the other was 
in Africa. So the, the Hercules columns was the end of the world. And the Spanish motto was non plus ultra. Then with the encounter of the old world and the new world, this changed. And now Spain is the country of plus ultra. Plus ultra is more beyond. And we want to go more beyond in everything, in intelligence, in uh, longevity, in love. In, in travel. We are going to travel to space very soon. So it is plus ultra in all areas. And I want this to, to happen in Spain as well. Yeah. One area where Spain, unfortunately, is not plus ultra is in legislation. Yes. Because cryonics, unfortunately, is illegal. Just like it's the same case, if actually not worse, because it's explicitly banned in British Columbia in Canada, actually. So can you tell us a little bit about that situation and what you're planning to do about it? Yes, this is very important because technology is changing exponentially, but the legal systems, the bureaucracies and the governments are either not changing at all or if they change, it is linearly slow. Therefore, we need to change the legal systems. Uh, and for that, global competition is also good. There are some countries where this is basically allowed and some countries or places where it, it is forbidden, as you mentioned in, uh, um, in British Columbia. In Spain, it is not really forbidden because it did not exist before, so you cannot forbid something that does not exist. However, it is not allowed. And when, pe <laughs> when people, yeah, yeah, because there are only two main treatments or, or things to do after you die in Spain. You can be buried or you can be cremated. That is what happens. Then in the, the law says there's no other alternatives. Yes, actually it, it has changed. That, that is why it is important to open possibilities. Cremation was also not allowed before. Also, oh, that's progress. Yeah, there was a progress. <laughs> Cremation was allowed. And then something also happened. Organ donation. Organ donation was allowed. In fact, also last year, I was in charge of the first cryopreservation in Spain, which was not, I would not say illegal, because I don't want to have legal problems, but it was illegal. Because it, it was is in the gray zone. Probably. In the gray zone. And then what we had to do, we had to donate the brain of our friend to science. And we sent him to another European country where this is allowed. Uh, and I'll tell you a basic difference between um, the Anglo-Saxon legal system and the Napoleonic or Roman code legal system. Uh, in the Anglo-Saxon legal system, whatever is not explicitly forbidden, it is basically allowed, yes. if it is not bad, obviously. No? In the Roman legal system, the Napoleonic Code, it is the opposite. If it is not explicitly permitted, it is basically forbidden. And that means that countries that derive their legal systems from Rome or from the Napoleonic Code are at a disadvantage today, are at a global disadvantage. And because science and all these changes are global, international, I like international competition also in laws. So right now I am working with the top three lawyers in Spain, the number one, number two, and number three lawyer of Spain uh, who are favorable to these ideas that they help us uh, to change the legal system to allow cryopreservation like cremation was allowed, like organ donation was allowed. So I hope that in one year, maybe two years, uh, we will have this possibility in Spain and also in other countries. I'm working with Canadians also, so that in British Columbia, they stop those stupid laws. Yeah, I agree. And, and to be as a Canadian, to be honest, I'm a little bit uh, disappointed and ashamed of, of that kind of short sightedness uh, of the British Columbia law. And I'm very happy that I'm myself in Ontario. But regardless, I think that law should be changed. But so what's the next step? Let's presume that we are a year or two from now and we have successfully changed the law. Then what's your next step in your plan? Um, in terms of um, cryopreservation, we do want to start a facility in Spain uh, when this is allowed so that we don't have to send our friends to other countries. We can keep them here closer to their families, to their uh, history in a way. So the idea is to open a cryopreservation facility. 
And there are many being born recently. Uh, there was one that was born in uh, Portland, Oregon, another one in Miami, Florida, another one starting in Australia, uh, and there are plants in many other countries. So this is only going to grow. Why? Because people will realize that we will have the possibility to live indefinitely very soon, in 20 to 30 years, and we will be able to rejuvenate people. Therefore, if you die now, this is the worst time to be to die. It is, <laughs> it is the, best time, the, the best time to be alive and also the worst time to die. Why? Because uh, we are so close to reaching rejuvenation or as what uh, Aubrey de Grey calls longevity escape velocity. We will soon, between 10 and 15 years probably, we will reach this target of living one year and adding one extra year to our life. Therefore, we will be able to live indefinitely and then rejuvenate. But until we reach that point, people will still die. Mm -hmm. In the next 5, 10, 20 years, people will die sadly. And if we want to keep them for the future, and if they also want to, to see the future, then we have plan B, cryopreservation. So I want to have cryopreservation. I want to cryopreserve my mother. Because even though she's in top condition, you know, I don't think she will make it 20 more years. And, and I don't want to happen the same that my father, my father was actually cremated. And, and that's very sad to lose your father and, and to know that you will never see him again. But we can change that and we want to do it in Spain, the city where my father was born. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, just, I mean, it's no comparison at all, but just yesterday my dog died, by the way. Uh, I found out and I wasn't even there and uh, you know we decided against cryopreserving her because her brain was in very bad condition she has had several strokes uh, maybe at least two maybe three strokes up to now and the last stroke just happened uh, the day before yesterday and she lost control over her rear legs and she couldn't even walk anymore so she was dragging herself and unfortunately my wife had to take her to the vet and she had to be put down uh, just to save her suffering because she was in a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. Uh, two, two things there because, yeah, this is a tragedy. We humans, we love our pets, we love our animals. Not only we love other people, we also love nature in general. She was a member of our family. Of course, of course. Well, let me tell you, well, you probably know, you know, actually, many people actually cryopreserve their pets. Yeah. In, 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 in the major cryopreservation facilities in the world, in some of them there are more pets than, than humans. So why? Because you also have several pets in your life because we live longer than the pets. So, but this is, this is important that we will be able also to keep our, our friends from the animal kingdom and from the uh, uh, plant kingdom, whatever. So, <laughs> so, so th th this will be a possibility and I think it is exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit more specifically about the people that came to speak at the Congress and sort of the idea of bringing all those people together. Was there uh, something else in terms of maybe perhaps the longevity kind of part of things? Because we covered a little bit more the cryonics part of things. Now talk to me about the longevity, the people that came to speak and maybe some of the themes that emerges, emerged after those fantastic three days we had here. Yeah, um, just to review the days, basically we had one day on longevity, one day on cryopreservation, and one day for mini courses, practical courses, classes. And we tried to bring the experts in, in their areas. So in terms of um, cryonics, we obviously had uh, people like uh, Max Moore, uh, like Greg Fahey, who actually is the developer of many of these technologies that we use also for in vitro fertilization. I mean, uh, Greg Fahey is a genius. We, uh, we also had um, um, Valeria Pride from Creo Rue, so that we have different points of view for cryonics. We had one of the top scientists in Spain, uh, Ramon Risco from uh, Sevilla University, and he and his students with Natasha Vitamore are the ones who prove that you can keep the memories of the world. See elegance. See elegance. So this is incredible. This was done only about two years ago with uh, some Spanish people and some American people. Uh, so this is collaboration, international collaboration, which I find beautiful. And um, in terms of longevity, also we have some of the world leaders, like obviously Aubrey de Grey, that is very known in, the, in your 
audience. Yeah. But we also had some other fantastic scientists, uh, including from Spain. Two of them who are really um, candidates uh, to, to the Nobel Prize for what they have done. One is Maria Blasco. She is the head of the Spanish National Research on Cancer. And she, she has been working with telomeras, telomeres, all of this. And, and she has genetically modified mice that now live three times their adult, adult life. And so she called them the triple mice because they live three times their adult life uh, in perfect condition or, or in good condition. So this is incredible. This was done here in Madrid. There is another scientist also from Spain, even though now he works in California, in Salk Institute in La Jolla, California, Juan Carlos Ispizua Belmonte. He's incredible. He's doing work on uh, chimeras, combining cells of different animals uh, so that you can have a, a heart from another an animal uh, for xenotransplantation. And he just did something also absolutely marvelous. He has been able to rejuvenate mice 40%. This is... Uh, fantastic news. He was interviewed by Scientific America, the MIT Technology Review. He even got to meet the Pope uh, because this has uh, religious implications in a Catholic country like mm -hmm. Spain or globally as well because we are talking about chimeras, you know, organisms or organs that come from two species. Yeah. So this is complicated. But, but the same happened with organ transplants. When organ transplants started 60 years ago, people say, you are going to have the organ of a dead person. That was at the beginning, but then it, it became worse when would you have the heart of another person and the loves of the other persons? That would be horrible. At the time, people said, fortunately, science advanced and then ethics and legal systems changed. So that this is allowed today and this is fine. And there are many people who have artificial hearts or hearts of other persons and soon might have hearts of pigs. Oh, people already have uh, operations where they get pig valves uh, implanted in their hearts to save their lives, actually. And, and that's been done thousands of times, if not tens of, pro tens of thousands easily. Uh, so my father, for example, he had uh, a bypass surgery in Bulgaria a few years ago. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, several years after, but he got one of those. And he probably had his life extended by three, maybe four years as a result of it. Um, so we have uh, many precedents for that, actually. But you mentioned the religious uh, implication, and I should maybe even call it a complication, if you will. Can you perhaps, and I don't know how comfortable you are to discuss, but some of the um, complications in a very uh, conservative and highly religious Catholic country such as Spain here, and perhaps the implications for the potential of having a conference in a place like Seville or other places in Spain. Yeah, um, Spain still is relatively a religious country for certain elites and institutions. So to talk about these issues is, uh, is complicated. Blasphemy? Uh, yeah, <laughs> almost blasphemy, yeah, because uh, I'm talking about the death of death. And some people say that is impossible. But not only impossible, they say this is... Uh, you shouldn't do it. It's yeah, immoral. Exactly. Immoral. Immortality is only for God. Only for God. They told me immortality is only for God. But we humans, we will transcend our condition and we might become gods. Actually, wouldn't that be beautiful? But, um, and this is what we believe. And certain religions like Buddhism and Hinduism, they believe in this transcending stage. They're much more open. Absolutely. So you will evolve into something closer to God or you will become God. This is what happens in Hinduism, in Buddhism. Unfortunately, in Western religions, especially Christianity and Islam, uh, we are supposed to be created in the image of God. Therefore, this is it. You know, we are already the image of God, but I cannot see myself as the image of God. If God is so imperfect as I am, I don't want to be this God. I want to be a better God. I want to be a more perfect God. So yes, there are religious problems. On the other hand, there are good things about religions that believe that eventually we could be immortal in heaven, but we can also become immortal here on earth. So why not do it here and taste it first? And if we like immortality here, we can stay or if you want immortality in heaven, well, go to heaven. But yes, there are certain issues. 
Uh, there is the most famous book in history in Spain, and actually I, I understand globally, Don Quixote. after the Bible, yes, Don Quixote. In Don Quixote, he says, with the church, we had to stop. This is or a because very, of the church. Oh, because of the church, yes. Because uh, in Spanish, uh, the, the original quote is, con la iglesia hemos tocado, which means, yeah, because of the church, we stopped, we had to, to stop. Um, that, that's very famous. So people told me in, in, in a place, yeah, you had some problems with the church. And indeed, we might have problems, but these things also change. I'll tell you something very interesting. Joseph Ratzinger, uh, 40 years ago, before he was the Pope, obviously, he was the head. That's Rottweiler, they called him, I think. No, I, I, I don't want to offend. <laughs> I, I don't want to offend anyone. But uh, Joseph Ratzinger, when he was the head of the doctrine of the Church, which is the current Inquisition, even though it is not like the Inquisition anymore, fortunately. Thank God. Yes. Or, or, or yes. us. But, but he, that was, he led that office, the equivalent, the doctrine of the Catholic Church faith. Anyway, uh, he said that in vitro fertilization was diabolic. It was a diabolic procedure because you could not have the conception of a human being outside a, a woman. Fortunately, Today, in vitro fertilization is normal. Yeah. And there are thousands, thousands and thousands Millions, of people that have been born thanks to this uh, yeah. technique. And they might have been, they might be little devils, indeed, you know. But soulless bastards, they, they argued that they would be soulless bastards because mm. they were con uh, con uh, conceived in a petri dish rather than in the womb of a woman. So yeah. therefore, no souls. Yeah. And they would be... Uh, uh, pathological uh, 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 sociopaths. That, those were some of the concerns people had at that time. Imagine, imagine, like with organ transplantation, having the heart of another person. Anyway, so today this is normal procedure. I think that when he became Pope, he already agreed it was okay because some of these people are Catholics. <laughs> some of these people who were born as little devils uh, now, without soul, yeah. suddenly they are good and they have a soul uh, for the Catholic Church. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about, about one thing that I am kind of differing with you very considerably, and that's the, uh, our attitude towards immortality. You like to use the word immortality as part of it is, you know, to challenge and to kind of shock a little bit uh, the audience and kind of wake them up from their kind of stupor and from their normal means. And I can appreciate that kind of shock value. But I personally prefer to stay away from the term immortality and I like more the term amortal because uh, we would still be mortal if, Aubrey de Grey, as Aubrey de Grey says, if a truck runs us over, we would probably die, right? But we would be able to extend our life indefinitely, right? So why do you prefer the term immortality better? Well, actually depends um, to whom I'm talking to. Uh, for certain, you know, scientific, very hardcore scientific groups, obviously I cannot talk about immortality because I know, like you do, that we can never know that we will be immortal. It is impossible because uh, someone might kill me tomorrow or today, yeah. Yeah. or we might have a comet crash against planet Earth. So we will never be able to be fully immortal. It is impossible, yeah. indeed. Yeah. But um, it is an easy word to communicate. Uh, in terms of talking to, the, uh, to scientists, I, I like to prefer to use rejuvenation, longevity extension, indefinite lifespans, or at least until you want to, because uh, we will have the freedom also. This is not a condemnation that you have to live forever, yeah. like in Greek methodology. No, no. And also that you will be getting older and older and older. No. We want to have rejuvenation. We want to live indefinitely. So it depends to whom I'm talking to. But the name of my book is The Death of Death, because death will be at least optional. Today, it is not optional. Today, there is only one way at the end of the road, which is death. Now you have burial and cremation and even organ donation, but, mm -hmm. but you're still dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when can we expect uh, your book, hopefully? Oh, it is coming out in 2018, and it will come out in four languages already that it have um, deals with uh, major publishing houses in uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Korean. Wow. 
and Korean. That's 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 tremendous. Let's talk a little bit about something else you mentioned. That obvious, the obvious fact that if someone comes to kill us now, we're not going to be immortal. So, so uh, actually, let me tell you because this is really bad. Someone here in Spain threatened to kill me already to prove that yeah. I was not immortal. Yeah. So, so yes, I do have concerns. Someone wrote to me with a fake email that he was going to kill me so that I am not immortal. Yeah, actually, and that's unfortunately the reason why I'm asking this question is because, uh, you know, Zoltan Istvan has been getting, who was the first transhumanist uh, uh, running for president. Now he's running for governor of California. Uh, he's been getting death threats since the publication of his book, The Transhumanist Wager. Ray Kurzweil, unfortunately, now has to go with uh, bodyguards uh, to many of the events that he goes to. Um, I uh, am not anywhere close to the level of public recognition that you guys are, but I have received a couple of threats that hopefully didn't seem to be too serious, but unfortunately, the, the kind of life that I live, you know, someone can Google me in one minute and find where I live and come and, come and kill me if they want to. So. Uh, do you feel that there are not like very substantial risks about doing that kind of work that you do and, and how wh how can you prepare for that? Uh, because clearly uh, you do very important work on the one hand, on the other hand, you're risking everything you've got, you're risking your life. Well, you are right and I am afraid because there are crazy people in they the are, world. Yeah. Uh, and there are many terrorists in the world. We see that every every day. But um, we need people also to be bold, to push these ideas. I am okay fighting with scientists, fighting with the church, uh, fighting also with terrorists. If we speak, if we try to communicate our ideas, because I'm here to change the world, and I think this is possible, and this will happen relatively soon. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe, seriously, in 20 to 30 years, we will be able to rejuvenate people, and we are not prepared, neither the good people nor the bad people, to put it that way. However, as Machiavello would say, you know, most people are good. Most people want to to do good things, they, they, they want to behave relatively okay, 99% of the people, but we have 1% of crazy people. But because uh, the majority are okay, I think these ideas will move forward. But we need to incentivize them. You know, also, for me to live indefinitely, I have to promote these ideas. And because I do have visibility, international visibility and credibility, I can move forward with these ideas and people will listen to me. Uh, also, there are other groups who are you know, because of uh, some religious ideas, uh, they believe in extraterrestrials, they believe in, in some other kind of immortality. You know, I try to separate myself from them mm -hmm. because I am a scientist. I'm an engineer from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I am very proud of my scientific training. So to me, this is science and technology, but it is in a way also based in science fiction because many of the things that are possible today or that will be possible in 10, 20 years are thanks to science fiction. Yeah. And I went to interview Sir Arthur C. Clarke about 10 years ago, and to me that was marvelous because he was actually an engineer. Sir Arthur C. Clarke was an engineer and he's a, he was an incredible person. The only person that has a dinosaur named after him, a, a star named after him, and an orbit a planetary orbit named after him. So it, it, it is quite, quite unique. Anyway, he became famous because of science fiction. But what made him so good, and he has made forecasts, even about immortality, until the year 2100. It, it, it really is incredible. It is in his book, Profiles of the Future. And he made uh, all these forecasts until the year 2100. And that includes immortality. And he was I don't know, let's say 80% right in the timing. So I believe this will happen because of scientific background. And that is why also Isaac Asimov, that I also had to, the pleasure to be with him in Boston because I studied wow. at MIT and he wow. was at Boston U University uh, or Boston College, uh, no university. Anyway, um, he was also a genius. Why? Because he was a chemist. Uh, I mean, he was scientifically trained. So all the things he wrote in his science fiction books were based on hard science. Yeah. Or Jules Verne. Also, he, he read a lot of, about science and he imagined traveling to the moon 
all, all these submarines, all of internet even. Uh, even it, the proto-internet idea, yeah. Based on pneumatic tubes, but doesn't matter. It's still like kind of the, the same idea as connecting information, uh, people with information and stuff like that. Um, so, okay, so what is the lesson perhaps, the biggest lesson after putting all these three three days of tremendous meeting and training sessions and conversations with people from all over the world. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned? That we still have a lot of work to do, <laughs> a lot of work to do, and that we have to be prepared to be attacked. Because uh, uh, if these ideas are thought considered crazy by many people. In fact, this is normal. Uh, before an impossible idea becomes possible, it is impossible and you are attacked as being crazy. So the, there are three stages of all of these ideas moving forward. And we are still at the first level. But let me tell you, because also I have known for two decades and I admire greatly Aubrey de Grey. When he started, he was really almost like a one lunatic. Yes. But now more and more people are understanding this, accepting it, and believing that it is possible. And now the question is, is this possible? No, it is, when will it be possible? So that is my hope, that more people understand this is science and technology and it will be possible. And the more people know that it will be possible sooner, it will become a reality. Two, two more things there. You know, cancer was discovered to be immortal, immortal in 1951. And most people in the planet do not know it. Cancer cells are biologically immortal. They do not age. Uh, again, we have to make a difference. They are not immortal. The objective is to kill cancer so that it is not immortal. <laughs> the objective is to kill cancer because cancer does not die on its own. Cancer uh, reproduces and it grows and reproduces and it does not die as long as it has a substrate where to live. Obviously, when the person dies because of the cancer, then the cancer dies within the person. But cancer does not age. This was discovered in 1951. And most people do not know it today. And we are talking a long, long time. So this is my point about medicine. Medicine has been a failure. Obviously, the medicine we have today is much better than the medicine we had a few centuries ago when we had bloodletting. You know, they would take out your blood to cure you. Yeah. That is one of the top medical treatments a few centuries ago. Everything was treated with bloodletting. Yeah. So in... In 10 to 20 years, we will remember how primitive we were with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Those techniques are like trying to kill a little mosquito with a canyon, you know, to kill a mosquito with a canyon. Uh, this is what we are doing today with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and many other medicines and therapies. We are very primitive today in our medicine. And the fact, I repeat, that cancer since 1951 is known by a group of people to be biologically immortal, and it's not known by the public, this is the greatest failure of medicine to me. To communicate to the public. Yes, of course. But now I hope more people will understand that cancer does not age and that we are going to discover it. Why? Because if cancer discovers how not to age, we should too. And for that, I have another thing to show you, a gene chip. With Devices like this, we will sequence our genes mm -hmm. and we will discover the mutations that create cancer because cancer cells are mutant cells. And now we can identify those mutations and we will compare the good cell with the mutant cell. And that is why Microsoft announced uh, in 2016 that they, that they plan to cure cancer in 10 years. Why? Because they will treat cancer as a biological virus. Not a computer virus, but a, mm -hmm. as a biological virus, and we will cure cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's not only done by or uh, aimed to be accomplished not only by Microsoft, of course, but, of course, but also by Facebook, by Google's Calico, by endless of other new startups that have been uh, set up for that specific purpose. Like Peter Diamandis, he has a company set up with Craig Venture, for example, called uh, Human Li uh, Longevity. Human Longevity Inc. Yes. Yes. And, and, and we and have many more. Yeah. Also, this disruption is coming from outside medicine. You know, you, you name them Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan, who is a medical doctor who yes. studied biology at Harvard. So not yes. any kind of medical doctor. Uh, Google with Calico, uh, Microsoft, Watson, 
I mean, IBM with Dr. Watson. I was with a version of Dr. Watson just recently in Korea, and it is incredible. It beats all human doctors yeah. just now, and it will only get better, you know? We, it will only get better. So we live in an incredible time. We are going to cure cancer in 10 years. I do believe that. Also, in Spain, there is a funda foundation working to cure um, paraplegic people. Why? Because it was a millionaire, actually a billionaire, uh, a Spanish person who died, and he died um, paraplegic. And so he donated a lot of his fortune to cure it. And now they can cure today in Spain paraplegic pigs. And soon they will start applying this to humans, obviously to, to go into the uh, human, trials. Human, human trials. But this has been done already in pigs. So I'm so happy, so excited. These things are happening in front of our eyes and it will only get better. Yes, yes. It's, we live in a, in a tremendous time. Uh, but unfortunately, we're almost running out of time. So I only have two or three more questions left here for our friend Jose, even though I can keep him quite honestly all day long. He's very busy and he's got a full program, which is why we're doing this at seven o'clock in the morning before his... Or on a Sunday morning. On a Sunday morning before his full day. So let me ask you this. What's next for Jose Cordeiro? Well, I'm changing the world in any part of the world. In the short term, like after the Longevity and Chronic Summit, where are you going? What are you doing? Well, we will do this again. I'm also uh, helping to organize the RAD Fest, Revolution Against Aging and Death, in San Diego, California, August 9 to 13. This will be a major event also. We expect perhaps to have 2,000 people this year, because last year we had 1,000 people. So we would like to double the amount of participants. But in any event, this is a big event. I'm working on my book, uh, The Death of Death, that will come out in four languages uh, to begin with, to begin with. And then um, also organizing a similar conference like this, the following one, also here in Madrid, I, I hope, because a lot of things are happening in Spain. And even though I have gotten death uh, threats, I hope this will not happen and we will continue uh, working on this. So I am committed. As my philosopher says, Goody Allen, a fantastic <laughs> philosopher, he says, uh, I will live forever or I will die trying. But I go even further than Goody Allen. I just don't plan to die. I think we will have the science and technology to live indefinitely, to rejuvenate ourselves very soon. And the sooner more people know that this will be possible, it will happen. This is also Arthur C. Clarke told me. Sir Arthur C. Clarke told me, many of these things end up as self-fulfilling prophecies, like Moore's law. Moore's law is not a law. It's basically a self-fulfilling prophecy because we have it already in our minds that we expect computers to become better and better and cheaper and cheaper and better and better and faster and faster, and smaller and smaller. So it is in our minds. The same with longevity. The more people realize that this will be possible and the proof that it, it is possible, I forgot to say that, why do I believe we will stop aging? Because it already happens. In the best cells, which are germinal cells, yeah. germinal cells do not age. The proof that not aging is possible because the best cells in our body, even though they are very few, the germinal cells do not age. Somatic cells, which are 99.9% .9 of us, they do age. But germinal cells do not age. Also, cancer discovered how not to age. Cancer is a mutation of somatic cells that age and become not aging mutant cells. So why we will do this? I'm an engineer. You know, the proof is there. It already happens. We only need to discover if how. If the germinal cells and cancers can do it, we can find out. Absolutely. I, I think we are more intelligent than cancer cells. Okay. I hope so. So, so we should be able to do it. So that is what makes me so happy. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy also. We need to believe we will do it and we will do it. And I am convinced we will do it. Uh, and of course, I can only support that. But for those of our viewers and listeners who want to follow you and your work, what's the best place for them to do that? Um, well, I have a website which is not very updated. It's basically my last name. Cordeiro.org, but uh, there, there are so many, many things in, in the media, in internet, um, also in several languages. I have um, 
uh, five TED Talks and uh, in English, in Spanish. I also speak Portuguese, French. So I have a lot of audiovisual material in several languages. And um, so just Google my name. But um, again, it is not important me. I think it is important the future of humanity and post-humanity. We will transcend the human condition. We will become better, more intelligent, um, even more, as Ray Kurzweil says, we will be more sensual, more uh, loving people. Um, more romantic people as well, incredibly intelligent. We will travel to other planets, those who want to. This is not mandatory. Nothing of this is mandatory. If you still want to die, you can die, no problem. <laughs> uh, so this is not obligatory that you don't have to die or th that you don't have to be more intelligent. Um, but I think also people will become more intelligent. And another of my phrases is, I am not afraid of artificial intelligence. I want to be more intelligent. Therefore, how can you be afraid of being more intelligent? I am afraid of human stupidity. And that, sadly, is very natural. Human stupidity is natural. And that is why I want to have more intelligence. I want to have more life. I want to have more love. I want to have more of everything. The universe is beautiful. And we live in a small planet, in a small solar system, in a small galaxy, in a fantastic universe, maybe a multiverse. We don't know. We will discover. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, as Jose knows, I, I totally agree that uh, humanity is unfortunately the greatest threat to humanity due to, unfortunately, our stupidity. As Einstein said, there's only two infinite things in the, in, that I know of. One is the universe and the other is human stupidity. And I'm not so sure about the universe. So, unfortunately, that's the greatest threat that we have faced since we uh, came to be on this planet and especially uh, as we get more and more powerful. Um, but we're pretty much out of time. So I just want to ask my friend Jose the very last question here. Jose, we've talked to you today for over 45 minutes. What's the most important single message that you would like to send us away with today? that um, humanity is advancing, it is progressing, everything is getting better, not continuously, and not in every sense, but it is getting better on average. And this is like love. You have to tell <laughs> your love friends, your family, I love you more than yesterday, but less than tomorrow, okay? The world will be a better place tomorrow and it will be even better the day after tomorrow. So I want you to be happy to think that uh, the, the world is a uh, glass half full. So even if it is difficult, don't think it is half empty. It is always better psychologically to think it is half full. So I want you to enjoy an eternal life or as long as you want to, full of energy, full of life, full of love, full of dreams. How can I ever close our conversation after this? I want to just keep talking and getting more and more of Jose's never ending energy. But I know he has other things to do. So all I can say is, Jose, thank you very much for being with us. No, thank and you for being my friend. No, thank you. I, I think I've been not always very deserving of your generous friendship, but you have been always very generous in sharing it with me. And I really appreciate that. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>